Um, oh, and sorry, um, I forgot to press record. Oh, all good, all good. Uh, and then uh, kind of how to use screen time and some common screen time concerns that I've heard. And then uh, Spirit and I are gonna have a conversation. Uh, last week, Spirit and I had a really good conversation uh, as to people who are on the spectrum about just what gaming means to us. And I kind of wanted to give her a bit of a spotlight to share her feelings and then going to open it up to questions. Um, so a bit about myself. I am Peter Young. I work for the ARC and uh, the INR program, and I am an autistic adult. I have a bachelor's in psychology, a uh, education degree in curriculum design, and I have been gaming for pretty much all my life. Um, I use gaming on the side to work with autistic kids, um, to develop social skills, to create safe space for socialization. I've also used a lot of tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons to teach uh, academic material and um, create like foster care uh, groups and various other therapeutic applications. Um, I've used a lot of gaming in my experience working with directly with families in my last job where I was doing in-home intensive mental health work uh, with kind of families that very often had a youth with a disability where there was a lot of gaming happening. And I was really kind of successful in navigating a lot of these conversations around um, where the problems with gaming were and creating kind of solutions where instead of it just being video games are just taken away altogether, it's let's figure out why video games are the problem and have the youth go through the process where they're really exploring why this was a challenge, which you know really sets them up to succeed in the future because they've realized, okay, this is something that was rough. My parents and I were able to work through it and we came out on top in a way that um, you know, was a, a, a process rather than just this thing that I was having some trouble with just got taken away gives them a bit more agency. So um, that's pretty much me. Um, I am a very avid gamer myself. Um, and I am just really, really excited to be doing this, this talk. Uh, Rachel, you want to go next? Or Spirit? Oh, yeah, sure. I am happy to introduce myself. Um, this, that's my dog, Finn, barking in the background. Sorry about that. Um, I work with Peter at the ARC. I'm the Community and Family Support Program Manager. And um, primarily I work with parents raising kids with disabilities. And I also am a parent myself of a, a almost 18 year old son who's autistic. And I'm also the parent of a 21 year old son who is um, ne mostly neurotypical. Uh, and I've worked at the ARC for seven years and I've been working in the disability field for maybe 13 or 14 years. So just love it and really excited to be here. How about you, Spirit? Um, I have been, I've been into gaming my entire life. More recently, I have been playing the Xbox and enjoying a lot of games on there. I mostly play with my boyfriend and a close group of friends. And I think gaming has really helped me become a lot more confident. Mm. Thank you so much for that spirit. I think we're going to dive into a lot more deeply into that later on, I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited that you're, you're here. Um, so uh, we have a Zoom poll. Um, yeah. This is just kind of to help me get a bit of a read on um, what your guys' experiences with gaming are. So the first question is, do you play video games? I just launched it. Can everybody see it? Yep. Okay, awesome. That's always a win. It's about 50-50. It's about Wonder, can I see it? Can I, can I vote? Um, oh, I don't think it. I can vote. Oh, you <laughs> can't vote. You can I can vote. Yep, you can. Oh. So far, we've had nine. We've had a hundred percent participation. So here we go. 
All right. So uh, about 50-50. Yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah, cool. More yeses than noes. Um, are you ready for the next poll? Yes, please. Okay. So do your children, do your children play, video play video games? I um, am the child. Yeah, it, 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 if, if you are the child, uh, just say yes. All right, so okay. that uh, that does make sense. Yeah, and if you had kids that don't play video games or you don't play video games, um, and I, I assume this could, could have some academic interest, right. but lar lar largely yes. Okay, next one. Yep. This is the most success I've ever had with polls. I feel like I need to tell you all. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yeah, this, is, this one has four options. How many hours do you or your child play video games in a week combined? 15 plus. Remember, it's confidential. No one will know your answer. Unless 100% of the people all say the same answer, then we'll know your answer. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So poll. mostly more than 15 hours. That actually tracks with what you know a lot of people, especially during the COVID epi uh, epidemic, were doing as far as uh, gaming because you know you're in lockdown. So absolutely yeah. tracked. Oh, uh, next um, question. My friends should be finishing up a game and then they will be joining. So awesome. I'm keeping an eye on the um on the the waiting rooms yep. so anyone who pops in we'll let them in okay Thanks. last one there's a yeah do your own child uh do, do your, your child, and your child you parent play video games together still neck and neck wow neck and neck yeah right, um here we go yeah i find this one surprising that so many people said yes it makes me really happy that so many people. Me say too. Yes. Yeah. Me too. Okay, um, I stop sharing. Yep. Yeah. All oh, right. So, the the final question, and I don't think there was a type in poll option. So, mm -hmm. if you can just throw in the chat what you and your child's favorite video game is, because uh, I'm curious about that. Mm -hmm. Roblox of Mario Party. Nice. Roblox and Minecraft. Okay. Seeing a theme here. <laughs> Minecraft. Yeah. I'm actually going to talk a lot or th th this gives me permission to talk a lot about uh, Minecraft. Attack on Titan. Yeah. I've heard good things about it. Me and my mom both like to play puzzle games. Is anyone here playing uh, Elden Ring? My boyfriend. <laughs> he's playing here. Yeah. Actually, I think he's currently playing that right now. Dark Souls. <laughs> The Dark Souls is pretty much Elden Ring, just lo less popular. All right. So I think that's a lot of folks. So um, thank you for that. That really helps me get a kind of a, a read on uh, what games you and your kids are playing. Um, so I really appreciate that. I'm, oh, Kerbal Space Programs. Yeah, that's a fun one. Um, I am really a big fan of Minecraft. Actually, a lot of the kind of therapeutic and autism work that I've done has been using Minecraft. And I think that it being a sandbox game, that creates a lot more of opportunities for really understanding and giving um, kids a space to build and explore. So he huge fan of Minecraft. And also I think Roblox is a little similar, but um, I, I hold Minecraft as like the gold standard on that front. So thank you for all those wonderful answers. Um, so jumping right into a bit of the history. Um, kind of one thing that as someone who uses gaming in a applied context, whether that is a therapeutic context or an educational context, or really you know any context I'm looking at, I really have to be aware of what the the media's focus on it is, you know, what, what the common concerns that parents are going to voice to me are going to be. Um, and like any form of media, gaming has had a lot of kind of alarmist media cycles. And this isn't to say that none of it is true, but 
there's been a lot of things where there's been a real heavy focus on one thing and not other things that are more serious problems. So thinking about the sort of alarmist history around video games, I and mean, if you look back in history, people freaked out about rock and roll. You know, they, they thought rock and roll was going to rock kids' brains. People thought the novel was going to rock kids' brains. And now you see a, a kid uh, reading The Hobbit and you think, that's awesome. Um, so my kind of focus when I started looking at how the media approaches um, gaming started in the, the 70s with the satanic panic with Dungeons and Dragons. Um, a young man, uh, unfortunately, ended his life and he was a huge fan of Dungeons and Dragons and the media kind of stuck with the narrative that, oh, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, made him kill himself, where the reality was he had been struggling with depression and they conveniently left that piece out of it. Um, but that really kind of stirred up a lot of controversy where they were afraid that d, &D would cause kids to have nervous breakdowns and get into Satanism. And that kind of paved a lot of the way around um, a lot of this game alarmist discussions around gaming. So then, you know, there were a lot of uh, existing discussions around television and violence, which is still a very complex thing. It's really contextual. Yeah, there are things that young children probably should not be watching. Like you don't want to show a five-year-old, um, you know, some super violent movie. You know, you don't want uh, your uh, kindergarten class watching Saving Private Ryan. But there's still like a lot of gray area on what the understanding of that is. Um, and then when video games kind of started getting popular, uh, there was a lawyer down in Florida named Jack Thompson who became this anti-video game crusader. And originally he had been really against uh, rap and, you know, all the lyrics and rap and he felt that that would incite violence. And then he really started focusing on video games and kind of saying that, oh, these, these video games are the root cause of whatever uh, shooting or thing he was focusing on. So he would find cases where someone had committed a murder or some type of violent crime and they just happened to be into some sort of video game and would sue the, the game developer and say, you see your, your video game caused this person to commit this crime. And so that was a really strong narrative for a while. And a lot of parents were really concerned about uh, gaming and violence. And then the, the wheel continued to turn and the discussion turned to addiction, video game addiction. And this was really fueled um, by a couple of cases in Korea where people playing World of Warcraft, a very popular fantasy role-playing game back then uh, that was multiplayer, uh, literally died at their computers. Um, they would go to these 24 seven LAN cafes or com computer cafes and after several days of gaming straight, they would just fall over dead. And what, again, was conveniently not included as part of these investigations was the fact that these people had just had a devastating breakup or they had just lost their job or were struggling with uh, severe depression. So again, people were looking at the video games and not, um, not specifically, are there other factors around this? So the pattern here is pretty consistently, let's look at this one very easy to comprehend issue and create a narrative around it instead of looking at a more nuanced issue and where there are risks and where there are problems, uh, that, that, that doesn't happen. You know, the news cycle wants to go with the, the narrative that, oh, video games cause school shootings or, oh, video games cause addiction or whatever. Um, so unfortunately, this has been an ongoing cycle. Um, and now the kind of big narrative is around uh, screen time and COVID. And also, unfortunately, uh, screen time and autism. And um, it's, it's something that I think is really a, a complex question because you want to talk about screen time and COVID. 
you know, if your kid went to school over Zoom, they're getting six hours of screen time a day. And that's probably got some, some issues, but I think a larger issue to look at is the isolation. Um, I think that thinking about what is the role in screen time in reducing isolation or, uh, you know, being a, a new socialization tool is something that a lot of people weren't focusing on. They were focusing on, oh, look, these screen time numbers are really high. Um, so there, there's just a lot of ongoing uh, conversation around that I think has lacked nuance. And again, the media always wants to really focus on these things. Um, these, you know, very kind of hysterical um, things around video games. And then unfortunately, there are a lot of kind of narratives and there have been some studies around screen time and autism. Um, and I've, I've looked at some of these studies and meta-analyses of these studies, and there's a lot of problems with a lot of these studies. And there's a lot more work to be done. You know, autism still really is not well known. And to think that it could be reduced to like one little thing, I think is not really helpful and also tends to really um, lead into some, some guilt trips. Like, oh, you let your kids uh, watch, uh, watch YouTube, they're gonna get autism. And you know, some really kind of nasty, uh, almost guilting and moral moralizing. So I, I think a lot of those approaches really aren't helpful um, for, for anyone. Um, they just provide you know, some moral high ground and some narratives that can actually be um, kind of nasty. Um, especially when, you know, for a lot of autistic people, screen time and video games are kind of a lifeline. So that is kind of a base history of some of the, uh, the media narratives. Um, and unfortunately, this, this really just kind of looks at whatever the, 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 the fad is, the, the sort of, you know, it's, it's violence, oh, it's addiction, oh, it's autism. So um, I think, you know, having more conversations that dive into it deeper and understanding that games are just a diverse form of media is really needed. So um, <laughs> next up, I would talk about the benefits of gaming. And this is actually a photo of me at age like 12 um, at my best friend's house. And I'm holding the Half-Life game. Uh, wanting to be the character from it because he's a theoretical physicist who kills aliens. I thought that was really cool. Um, so for disabled people um, and specifically for autistic people, gaming has a lot of benefits. Um, you know, one I've, I've heard a lot in uh, disabled gamer circles is it's free occupational therapy. So you have someone who struggles with uh, fine motor control. Well, using a controller can kind of give them opportunity to practice that that isn't mind-numbingly boring. They're playing a video game. Uh, it creates socialization opportunities. You have kind of opportunities to go over to your friend's house and play video games or play online. Uh, with the advent of online gaming, there's a lot more opportunities for some healthy socialization. So that's really exciting. Um, they're, as autistic, you know, someone who is on the spectrum, I become uh, dysregulated quite a bit. Um, and it can be really challenging to bring myself down. And one of the most reliable ways to go through a routine process where I'm just doing like a set number of tasks and they're all in the same order with minor variation is to play a game. You know, go through a level of a game that I played a million times before it's relaxing. I know it's this complex kind of spreadsheet that I need to go through in my head. That can help me self-regulate. Um, and the other sort of side of that is play is fun. Humans need to play. Play is a healthy part of human development. And I really think that the need to play does not go away when you're an adult. The reality of play, unfortunately, often does for many of adults. Many adults stop playing when they become a, a, an adult. But video games can be a fun way to kind of have that sort of make-believe space, that sort of space where you can get outside your head and sort of have this imaginative world. 
I think that there is a lot of benefit to that. Um, there's also kind of a proliferation of um, online gaming communities and IRL gaming communities, which is in real life gaming communities. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, friends that I have known both online and in real life that I've made through gaming that I've known for 10 years. They're very, very close to me. Um, I, I really, really care about them and they really care about me and support me. And gaming has been a really- Same for me, just not as long. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I've, I've been doing this. I've been gaming since I, I don't even remember, but I've been making friends through gaming for a long time, and it's been a really good way to make friends. Um, it's a structured social activity. Um, sometimes for autistics, being in an unstructured social situation is really stressful. And both board gaming and video games offer kind of a space where you know what to say. You're hanging out the rules of this social situation are clear. And that I think is sort of a social scaffolding that also reduces a lot of that social anxiety. Um, I know Spirit, you have, we're, we're gonna talk about that, that with you a little bit mm -hmm. soon. Um, and then uh, another cool thing is there is a lot of work being done within increasing accessibility for disability within the gaming community. And I think that by getting more word out, uh, out about accessibility needs is a good thing. You know, there's adaptive controllers for people who uh, might have, you know, motor difficulties. There's also a lot of game design things that are happening. Um, like, you know, using different fonts for dyslexic people or adding different difficulty modes for people who might uh, struggle with, you know, harder games or, um, using different color color palettes so people who are colorblind can see it. So that's been a really uh, cool thing that's happening. And I think one of the, the, the big uh, things to talk about with benefits of gaming is that gaming is a form of media. Gamings are as diverse as books are diverse. And books have different benefits depending on a book. And they also have, you know, there, there's books that probably don't have as much benefits for certain people. You know, if you see your, uh, a kid reading, you know, the, the, the Hobbit or, um, I don't know, some, a novel, you think that's probably a good thing. If you're seeing a, a kid read, I don't know, um, uh, the, the anarchist cookbook, that's probably a little concerning. Um, you know, it's, it's, it ultimately comes down to understanding it as a diverse form of media that can meet different needs. What someone gets out of Minecraft is going to be very different than what someone gets out of Grand Theft Auto. And that's not going to, that's not to say that Grand Theft Auto has zero use. You know, if you have someone who's using games to build motor skills and they love playing Grand Theft Auto, well, then it's useful. It's meeting that need. <laughs> So I use this my um, driving when I started to learn how to drive. I would get on Grand Theft Auto and just follow the roads randomly and try to, <laughs> you know, be in first person, meaning that it was only me seeing from the character's perspective. And I'd look around, see if I could notice the car next to me. But um, GTA um, NPCs, non-playable characters, are definitely don't care that much about road rules. Yeah, I, I will say uh, learning your, your traffic rules from Grand Theft Auto is probably not recommended. Yeah, but I meant like the stoplights and lane turning. Yeah, and so sadly they didn't do a, a, a very good job with, you know, adhering to traffic rules, but, you know, it is Grand Theft Auto. Um, yep. So uh, what the next thing I want to kind of talk about now that I've talked about, you know, some good things uh, that disabled people can get out of gaming. Um, I want to kind of bring up some of the risks and some of these kind of very much exist as something that is a problem like right now in this moment in history. Um, and the other thing is a lot of these exist as things that are risks of just being on the internet. Um, so the, the first kind of risk that a lot of people have discussed uh, within kind of the, the game studies and applied gaming world is the risk of radicalization. And this is actually something that I've seen happen to an acquaintance of mine. 
Um, and what it is, is white nationalist groups um, will sometimes target specific gaming communities and start kind of filling them with really racist material with the intent of saying, oh, it's just a joke and all the snowflakes that don't like it can leave, which leaves you know people who are kind of a bit more edgelordy and then you start dropping the conspiracy theory stuff, you know, starting with usually anti-feminist stuff and then anti-Semitic stuff. And by the end of the, the people who still think it's kind of a gaming community that's kind of edgy are now getting exposed to a lot of, you know, white nationalist material. And it's, it's something that I actually have seen. Um, it breaks my heart about that acquaintance because he is a disabled person and he lost his job. Um, and you know, be, because you know he wasn't able to uh, do the commute, and it was very very sad because um, he was just completely isolated. And seeing that transformation in him was just absolutely jarring. When you know a few years later, I I get in touch with him, and he's full on like racist conspiracy theories. So that is something that can happen, and they will kind of try to target a specific usually disaffected young white men. Um, so be kind of aware about the community they're hanging out with and keep an eye on the chat. You know, see if there's like a lot of slurs happening. Um, the next one is online bullying. Uh, online bullying looks different than real life bullying. Sometimes it can be fairly invisible, but it can still happen and it can happen inside games. If you see kids kind of destroying other kids things that they're making in Minecraft and really kind of picking on their them and killing all their animals, they might be bullying that kid. So kind of have conversations around that. Um, there can, I've noticed there can be a difference between online bullying and people just being mean because they can. They're not necessarily targeting somebody. There are types of players that are called griefers they yeah. just go around and they try to um uh ruin everybody in the game's day it doesn't really matter who it is they just want to be mean for the sake of being mean but there is of course online bullying i'm mm -hmm. just saying that there is different types of it it doesn't it isn't always necessarily targeted at one person mm -hmm. um, it can be targeted as a multiple types of people like there are certain uh, people who play certain games who um, if they find out you're playing a game that they don't like they'll tease you and bully you for it but that's just how they think there's not going to be much you can do to besides getting away from them to make them I think you froze Oh, you're, you're back. All right. Yep. No, I'm here. The, oh, just... yeah. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, and it, it really highlights that bullying online is a completely different animal than in person bullying. And yeah, I, I would argue that griefers are bullies, they're just indiscriminate. Um, but I, I think that's a really important thing to bring up that, you know, there is targeted harassment and then there's, you know, some specific. Yeah, there's there's different. So that's that's a people very good. being mean because they think, yeah, people being mean because they think it's fun. Yeah, yeah, and unfortunately, like a lot of the times, you know, they're just not not thinking about you know the other person's perspective. But there are ways to kind of approach those conversations, um, and just kind of say, well, what if this happened to you? And sometimes it comes down to getting them into a space where that sort of behavior is acceptable. You know, throwing, throwing uh, food at someone, you know, when they're not expecting, or th throwing a, a ball at someone when they're not expecting it would be really mean, but, you know, throwing a ball at someone when you're playing dodgeball is just part of the game. So trying to find a more healthy kind of outlet for that can be really, really helpful. Yes, um, but sadly, there are people like that who you try to talk to them and try to help them and all they'll do is insult you. There's no way to possibly get them oh, to yeah. listen. That is always very annoying. I've had that happen 
a couple times. Um, and there are, I'm trying to say that there are some people online that you meet, they're just best to leave alone. Mm -hmm. Blocking is your friend. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that's actually one of the nice things about uh, online bullying is there is a block button. So yep. one of the best, best tools in your inventory. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Uh, yep. Is, and I personally, also for me, it's terrifying to go up to somebody and say, hey, I don't like that you're doing this. Can you please stop? I don't really want to talk to you again. Instead, it's just a click of a button. I don't have to go up and actually socialize with that person. And many times they're not bothered too much by it as yeah. well. Yeah, no, I, I think that is a, a really strong benefit of, um, you know, online space for someone, you know, who is on the spectrum. And, you know, me, you know, I being, you know, I don't do uh, as many open games. I'm usually doing like closed games with people I know. But, you know, if I'm doing an open game, yeah, definitely having that block option is absolutely a godsend. So thank you for bring that up. Um, yep. So the next kind of two pieces are uh, kind of financial uh, risks. Uh, some Sometimes within the context of gaming, uh, there are items that are worth money that you spent real world money to buy. And sometimes people will scam you out of that. And that's just something that can occur within games. They somehow get your item and then they log off and you never see them again. Um, one uh, way that a friend has been advertised in that way is there are people who will buy your online account and level you up in games and give that back to you. But of course, there are scammers who take that account and then delete that account, deleting all your progress. You can't get it back, do something to your account so that nobody can ever use it again. Uh, that is... Uh -huh. yeah or try and buy friendship by giving them stuff yeah oh um, yeah no it's it's that i think the the other piece you know there is some predation some predatory behavior with some people who are just you know not not up to any good and then the the other kind of real insidious um piece is the microtransactions piece um where you're making these little purchases in this game to give you in-game items um and or, you know, like you in really quick like in uh fortnite you can buy levels to level yourself up yep. as well the the actual like large concern that i've seen around the microtransaction isn't so much with the disability community i know a lot of people with adhd um have complained about microtransactions because when you have someone who struggles with like impulse control and you know beating the game and getting these little things in the game it's just a click it's they want to do it and they might not be paying as much attention to how much money they're spending so they just spent like 60 bucks in a night on a video game um when that was not their plan so they can be really insidious in how they design it and it's intentional unfortunately a lot of apps are real predatory um and the other area where it's really toxic is slots apps. Um, and there have been a number of reports about senior citizens, actually. Which um, I've actually kind of figured out how those things work. Um, hmm. They, um, like, I'm sure everybody has gotten those um, ads that say, you know, playing this, play this bingo game and you can win $1,000 in one day. What they actually do is you pay money to play that specific game, but only the top ranking people in that game actually get money back. So they're taking players' money to give it to one or two players. Yeah. So it's and not it, a guarantee. Oh, and it's incredibly predatory. And it's it's looking at, you know, a lot of these senior citizens who probably like to play bingo at the community center. And, you know, now due to COVID, they're, um, you know, quarantining and they, they're, you know, spending their entire uh, retirement on these, these apps. So it's, it's, that is kind of one of those areas, you know, well, people are busy talking about, you know, autism and, you know, violence and addiction. It's like, let's, let's maybe look at this predatory design that does have some addictive pieces, but I think is more similar to gambling addiction. 
and a very specific slice of gaming. So I, I think that's a very kind of nuanced area. Yeah. So and a good way that I've learned also from friends to give you their information, um, their name asks you to join something, gives you a web address to go to that is very, oh, like 99% that's a scam. So mm -hmm. just avoid those, especially if there isn't a, um, in, uh, if you try to talk to them and they say, no, I don't want to talk, that's most likely what is called a bot, a robot. It's not an actual person. Yeah, there's, that's also a big thing. A lot of this is automated out of, you know, weird places. So um, moving to the next thing. Um, so this next thing is kind of um, discussing screen time as um, uh, what, how you can use it. Or, and, and a lot of this actually comes down to how I've used it um, when working with families. So what would happen a lot is I would get called in at my, my last job where I was doing in-home intensive services. And I was kind of known as someone who works really well with video game uh, cases where video games is a trigger or there's problems around video games or the kid goes berserk when the video games are involved. You know, just whatever the, the like concern that they came to us was. And what I found generally was pretty helpful was to look at the larger ecosystem. So I would look at uh, what is the kid engaging? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What is the youth engaging with? How are they engaging with? What are they playing? Who are they playing with? Why, why do they seem like they like this game? Um, what are they doing in the game? And then ask them about it. You know, get the parents to, and you know, have these facilitated kind of discussions about like, so tell me about this game. And very often I would get a two hour lecture on this game. And from the perspective of the youth, they've never had an opportunity to be an expert like this and yes. to, be, to be the teacher. Um, very much. I, that's definitely my experience uh, many times. And so when I'm able to teach something to somebody else that makes me feel really good, even if they might not think it's the best thing in the world, like I do, it still feels good. Yeah, well, I, I think that, um, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss fun yeah. special interest stuff because I, I think that that hits on a thing as well. But um, when another thing that I would do in these cases was I would look at how they're interacting with others in the game. Um, so are they uh, like, are they swearing a lot? Are they using slurs? Or are they, you know, helping their friend build a, a castle? Are they talking with their friends about, you know, hey, I'm worried about my buddy Frank. You know, he seems like he's depressed. Or, hey, I'm, you know, do you remember what homework was for Miss Keller's class? Um, you know, it's, it's inner, pay attention to what they're doing with people within the game world. And then start looking at, you know, once you have a pretty clear idea of what the gaming looks like, start thinking about what's the function? Why are they doing this? People game because gaming does something for them. People don't game when games don't do whatever they, they want it to do. You know, I know that there's games that I don't spend any time playing because they're not fun for me. They don't get yep, my need met. Me and my friends have a very common thing that happens of we'll get really, really, really into a game for a couple of months and then not want to touch that game again for like a year. Uh, mm -hmm. But we'll rotate through games uh, based on kind of what we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, I, I think um, just really paying attention to what the need is that's getting met. and. Sometimes they're trying to meet a need and it's not working and understand why it's not working because a lot of the escalations are happening, I've seen, because they're trying to calm down and the game isn't calming them down. Or they're trying to relax and 
you're telling them to get off the game and they're not able to relax because they think that the game is the only thing that can relax them. So that can really elucidate a lot of, um, a lot of conversations about it. And I think it's a lot more productive to have a conversation of, okay, maybe this type of gaming isn't the right type of gaming for you rather than, okay, I'm taking all the games away because what that does, you can finish. Uh, what that does is that creates an opportunity where growing up, A, they're able to work through something difficult with their neurodivergence with support from you in a way where they end up with a better understanding of how they function and what's safe for them and what's helpful for them versus, hey, this is something you were having trouble with and I'm just going to take it away. They didn't get to conquer that issue. Uh, it was just that opportunity to work through an issue was removed. Um, and that's not to say that sometimes there are like safety issues or whatever, but I think when you're able to go through that kind of process of why is this happening and gaining self insight, that can be really critical in resolving kind of concerns about um, the, the function. Um, and then, uh, oh, go ahead. Can I say what I was gonna say? Yeah. Um, also with um, people who have autism and gaming, uh, they might be meeting a need that might not always uh, be what you are think they're meeting uh, or what they're trying to meet. Like there can be times where I'll be playing a shooter game, but I'm actually learning about something completely different than something that's physical. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, People with autism tend to make their own connections with things in a different way than other people do. So sometimes it can be a bit tricky trying to figure out what is it that my kid is actually um, thinks that this is uh, versus what it actually is. And so that's also a good thing to teach them as well. Uh, it's very good for social skills too. No, I, I think that uh, that's a really interesting thing to just uh, say what the actual purpose is may not be as overt. Um, but going back to you know understanding the need, sometimes there's really good bonding opportunities around playing games together. And then when you have that sort of space where there's that trust um, and that, that gaming together. You know, I've seen situations where kid and dad can't talk to each other without it devolving into a screaming fit, but then they start gaming together, they both enjoy it, and then they're able to talk. And then dad is able to model, okay, it, I've been gaming for an hour, I'm gonna put the controller down because that's, that's, that's me mo normalizing and modeling gaming boundaries. Um, then there's the special interest piece, uh, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, and then, you know, sometimes and very often I would see escalations. And again, this is never easy. And I could probably talk for hours about um, escalations that occur during gaming. But the thing that I always really would do is try to understand why and give the kids the opportunity to clarify what their issue was or what, what, what their struggle was, what, what is happening in gaming. And sometimes they would be able to make those connections themselves when they had the, um, the space to say it. They could say, yeah, actually, whenever I play this game, I die a lot and I get super angry. You know, creepers always blow me up. And, you know, then I get super mad. I start punching my brother. And now you're able to say, okay, you're getting angry because creepers keep on blowing you up. Well, let's let's look at playing on peaceful mode or creative mode, um, things like that. And then, kind of the the last piece is um, understanding that you know, you know routine can be very very important. Uh, I'm sharing a screenshot or a, the the picture here is something that I do at 6 p.m. every Monday. I play a quick uh, speed run of the game Taskmaker, and that is kind of how I wind down my Mondays. You know, I I'm on a, a Discord call with my friends. They're watching movies. I'm speed running this, a game that normally takes seven hours. I finish in 32 minutes. And that 
really sets me up for success during the week because that is a routine thing. I know all the steps. There's mild variation here or there, but I kind of know how it's going to go. And that really, really helps me be in a relaxed place for the rest of the week. Um, so moving on, I'm, so, yep, yeah, uh, moving on to the questions. Um, Hello. So I'm trying to figure out how to make, okay. So uh, one of the things that when we were talking, you mentioned was a uh, really strong social network through gaming. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I um, started gaming with my when my boyfriend gave me his old Xbox because he had gotten a new one and his old one still worked. And so I started gaming on that but um other friends i also knew uh, in real life i like at school also were into gaming and so we would meet that way and then meet kind of friends of friends and now i have a really great friend group um there's about 10 of us like half of us are regularly on every day or most of the week other half it's kind of they come and go whenever they please but one of my friends i've actually adopted as my dad and he takes that role very seriously um like one time there was a power outage and so i randomly went offline i just randomly disappeared and so he texted me really worried hey are you okay what happened just like don't worry the power just went off <laughs> That's fine. Uh, so I have uh, some really great friends and actually some of us plan to move in together within the year when we get enough money. Um, some of them are here in Seattle. Some of them are um, in California, and Louisiana. Um, but I really love my friends they've made me such a better person um i really don't know where i would be right now if i didn't have them yeah. so th thank you and i think um some of that's really cool is that um you know through connections you've made through gaming uh it's helping you you know, find your own place and, uh, you know, have, have roommates and go through that, that whole adventure. So that's really cool. Um, the next uh, question you had was talking about, um, you, you mentioned gaming as a reason to hang out with friends in a structured way. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, one thing that each of us have something that we're pretty good at, well, most of us, um, there, each of us have something that we're pretty good at with gaming or something that we really like to do. Like my friend Val really likes to uh, be a sniper in games. And so often if we need a sniper in a game, we'll ask him to come. I like to be a medic. Um, Ash is a great tactician, um, especially when we play Sea of Thieves. I'm the... Um, it's a pirating game. You sail around on a pirate ship with uh, friends. And I'm kind of the main repair person because your ship can get damaged. And as one of my friends said, spirit just sneezes in the entire bottom deck of repaired. I, I think what's... Um, oh, go, go. Then, You can finish. Oh, uh, I, 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 I thought your, your screen froze for a second. No, yeah. I, I think some, something that I've seen a lot with online gaming is that they create roles for people yeah. that don't exist in a, a, uh, in a traditional sense and they're very overt. So in a traditional kind of neurotypical social situation, 
existing in a social place can be really difficult. You don't know what your role is. Are you, you know, someone who's the conversation leader? Are you helping the conversation out? Are you like the host? Whereas this is like, oh, I'm the mechanic. So I know exactly what I'm doing. I know what's expected of me and I'm still helpful. I'm still being social. I'm still adding something of value. Um, and I, I, I think our, our last, you know, when we had this first conversation, there was something you said that was really interesting. It helps me, something like, it helps me feel needed. Yeah. And I, I, I really, really like that because yeah. I've had similar experiences where knowing that I'm the medic, that my buddies need me, it gives me this, this specific sense of belonging that yeah. I might struggle to uh, navigate in, yeah. in other situations. Um, so the, the next uh, question, um, we, we kind of started talking about this a little bit, was uh, gaming as a special interest. Yeah. Um, can you clarify on that? Yeah, I, I, I'm, like, I took like a bunch of notes when we had that, um, <laughs> that conversation. Well, actually, I, I think it's something that um, I think we were just kind of agreeing on that we both can get really special interesty with games. Yeah. You explain and, what special interest means, Peter? What, oh, what do you so, mean? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes, I apologize. Um, <laughs> That's okay. uh, so for an autistic person, um, we get special interests, which means like usually it's like trains. Trains is a really common one um, where you have an autistic person and they can tell you every type of train that has ever existed and they could talk about every single part on the train. <laughs> yeah, every different part of the train, the history of the trains, yada, yada. For me, uh, I have special interests of video games, special interests of bees, um, and I can talk about these things at length. I could talk about forever and not talk about anything else, and I would be completely happy. And there are certain video games that I can spend just hours monologuing about. And I, I think, Spirit, you kind of feel the same way about some games sometimes. Yep, and it feels really good when you also find somebody else with a shared interest too because it's not just you going over that information with yourself you, you can share it with others and oh have you tried this thing to get this oh no i've never even thought of that let's go try that um that's something that we do um we'll also help each other to in games when we're struggling um everybody has I've noticed that everybody has their go-to game when they're stressed. Uh, one of my, my boyfriends will go play Halo on the hardest difficulty to uh, de-stress. Um, my adopted dad, Cross, will go blow stuff up in games. Um, and I like to create stuff. I love um, creating houses and stuff. And so that's usually what I will go to, to have our own type of game that we like or prefer, uh, but we all like to play games together. And it's great to exchange information about different games as well. You're that, that, that that's well, no that's something off topic <laughs> no 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 that, that you're, you're hitting on actually a, a couple of really interesting things um mm -hmm. first off you're talking about you know finding someone else with the same special interest and just sort of geeking out together you know yeah. i i've heard special interests is an autistic love language and it yeah. absolutely is you know geeking out about special interests is you know you get two autistics and they're just going off about you know a video game or trains or whatever that is my my boyfriend way. and my dad can talk for hours about star wars absolute <laughs> hours about it together yeah that, that that used to be me and then the prequels came out and i i kind of like 
walked away from all of it it's it, it, it's still a wound I'm, it's still healing yeah they're um, they're both super into the lore and stuff so oh, they like too. to do that yeah no i was really really into like all the imperial different ships and stuff um in any case uh the other thing um oh, um my mom put something in the chat can you explain that you and your friends can all be doing separate games but be connected on headsets and be talking yes that is commonly something that we'll do um many times we'll often be on different games because all of us together we don't all have one shared game that everybody else has so it can sometimes be difficult to find a game for everybody to play at once um and so often they're uh, like, I'll usually be like, I don't really want to play this game, but I'm more than happy on listening in the conversation with you guys as we talk. And most of the time when we're talking online, it isn't really about the games that we're talking about, unless there's a lot of us playing together. We'll talk about how our day went. Um, my friend Doc, we love to hear stories from him. He was an army medic and he has some great stories that we love to hear from him. Um, and so we just like to, it's kind of a talking about everything and nothing kind of situation. We're just enjoying each other's company. Um, there's a funny thing that I saw that definitely explains online friendships. I think in a fairly good way. Um, within the first hour, you learn um, their, you learn somebody's entire childhood and past and any trauma that's happened to them. And three years later, and three years later, you're like, wait, you have a dog. <laughs> that yeah. is, that is what we <laughs> do. Yes, we're just like, wait, I didn't know you had a dog. What's your dog's name? No, it, it internet socialization is very unique um yes. although what, 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 what is kind of uh interesting is that what actually was one of the the questions i was about to ask is um how is socialization different when you're gaming and actually you're you're really hitting on something that i discovered during the early pandemic when there were lockdowns and i had to do telehealth very often when i was trying to do telehealth with a kid and they were playing a video game, it was going terrible until I would pull up Minecraft. So I'd start, you know, messing around in Minecraft. They're doing something else. And so I'm kind of talking and kind of clip conversation and just kind of meandering. The the, the whole prose of the conversation, the whole structure of the, the conversation changed from so, so tell me, and the kid be like, uh-huh uh-huh two yeah so school going good yeah it's going okay remember you were uh having some problems with that one teacher is that going a little bit better nah she's still giving me trouble really uh, is it is it that that assignment that that she's asking nah she's uh that that's already done it's, it's something else yeah well what is it uh you know it's it, so suddenly because we're both gaming the entire sort of almost cognitive social space was different. And I was able to do teletherapy again because I was playing Minecraft on the job and uh, it, it, it worked wonderfully. So there is like a different cadence when you're playing with people that I picked up on and it's really cool. Yeah, and I've noticed, uh, especially with meeting new people online, you tend to share a lot more personal information but in a comfortable way, like if you went up to somebody and went in, and within an hour started talking about um, some deep, dark fear that you have, they just kind of be like, what are you doing? Why are we talking about this? Meanwhile, if I do that on and there's like, oh yes, I've had that fear. This is my thing too. Um, so it kind of, say a bit some of that words are a thing um actually that was something that i saw a lot 
um, when I was working with teens is that online social spaces and gaming ended up being a really critical mental health uh, resource because a lot of them saw kind of these gaming communities as spaces where they could open up about stuff. They didn't feel comfortable talking about it at school um, necessarily, but you know, when, it, when they were hanging out with their buddies online, they could feel a lot more kind of like they, they, they could take that wall down a bit. So I, I actually, you know, heard about it a lot of situations. It's safer. Yeah, yeah, it, it's safer. And that's, that, that is a really is critical um, kind of thing that gaming created a safe space to discuss kind of stuff that might be a bit more uh, difficult to talk about. So that's, that's a really, really good point. Um, so. And uh, really quick, something that I find funny is I'll usually be, I can't multitask very well. You can, if asking me to do chores, you can really only give me two things at once, more than three, three things I forget, but it drives my mom crazy how I'm able to be playing a game, uh, watching a show and talking to people at the same time. Meanwhile, I'm writing notes down about something else too that drives her crazy sometimes she's just like how are you able to do that that doesn't make any sense but for some reason i'm able to do that perfectly fine autistic so brains are find funny. what autistic brains are very interesting yes very interesting i i i, I have one i enjoy having one <laughs> but man are they weird sometimes <laughs> really weird yeah. like why are you doing this <laughs> yeah um, so anyways, the, the, uh, the, the next kind of really big question I want to really touch on, um, and then I want to kind of open up to general Q&A, um, how has gaming with friends helped you grow and mature socially? Um, it's helped me become a lot more confident um like before i started gaming if i i would not feel comfortable at all going up to uh somebody uh random even if they were talking about something that i found interesting i would be absolutely terrified meanwhile now um i'll uh miss i'll overhear somebody talking about uh, an interest that i have and i'm just like oh yeah i like that uh, that too and can sometimes start conversation with them as well um also the main thing socially that's uh, socially different online than in person is in person talking to somebody i can really like face to face i can really only talk for 30 minutes to an hour at most but when talking online i can talk for hours with my friends and um, my friend Ethan, who is also um, a high functioning autistic, he mentioned that when I asked him what um, has gaming helped him with his autism. And he kind of said that it's because it takes that, down that physical interaction. There's one less thing that you need to worry about because me, I can get overwhelmed extremely easily, even by small things. Um, so, you know, being in front of somebody and talking can be overwhelming, but if it's just the vocal um, part of that, that's all I have to worry about. I can talk for a much longer time than I would in real life. No, um, so, Thank you so much. Um, yep. Yeah, this has been absolutely wonderful hearing your perspective. Yes. And this has been fun. Oh yeah, no, it, 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 what's been really cool is a lot of the things you've talked about are things that I've kind of gone through um, and gaming has really helped me with. And you know, my, my big kind of social development actually was, <clears throat> there was a lot of video gaming, but also like a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and playing with friends and being able to 
you know, be safe because you were pretending you're an elf or something. Um, there's, you know, an aspect of safety yeah. in that sort of projected world. And I think video games also can have that that layer of safety. Um, yeah. Um, really quickly before we continue, one of the things that I love the most about video games is it's a completely different way about what's going on in this world right now. Um, many times if I can, I like to um, make a character in a fantasy game and make them try and look as much like me as possible. And I'll play like as if like, you know, like if I had any choice of weapon, what weapon would I choose? If I had any choice of magic, what would I choose? Would I rather do this or would I rather do that? It's nice to be, it's nice to put your, your mind someplace else that you don't have to worry about what is realistically going on. There's um, a uh, web comment uh, called Ask Speaks and she draws comics about her daily life, um, which I've found is um, a great way to explain some of the things. And one of the comics she has is she's walking into the room, everything's gray and dark, and she sits in front of the screen and turns it on and this entire rain this entire beautiful field of rainbows and flowers of unicorns just comes on and she gets kind of dragged into that. That's pretty much what it feels like. So it's a good, it's a good escape. Mm -hmm. It's good to, be, to put myself someplace else. No, uh, and, and I think, you know, people knock escapism, but escapism is healthy, you know, to, yeah. in moderation, escapism is healthy. It's, you know, something that people need to do. And if gaming is how you're able to achieve some healthy escapism, then that's awesome. But again, thank you so much. It has yep. been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Yep. Um, at this point, I wanted to just open it up to Q&A. Um, Spirit, if you want, you can stay on for, for this. Yep. If there's any questions for you. Yep. <laughs> Does anybody have questions for Peter or Spirit? That was such an incredible conversation. I, I'm so grateful for both for that presentation, Peter, and for what you've shared in your additions, Spirit. Yeah, let's give people a second. It takes a second to type. Mm -hmm. I, I actually do have a question for you, Spirit. Um, yep. That just kind of came to mind, but I'll, I'll, I'll let other people ask. But the I, I, I find... Um, I find that you make, you know, in-game avatars that look like yourself interesting because I actually sometimes I'll do the same thing. And yeah. it's it's just interesting to have that like second layer in there. Ever ever since I was young, I always loved imagining myself in different scenarios. Like there's the typical scenario that I think everybody has a daydream about at least once of, you know, if there's a school shooter, how would you, uh, how would you protect the school, something mm -hmm. like that. And so to be able to put what I'm seeing into my head into what's being in front, what's in front of me, mm -hmm. uh, felt really good. So gave me as a new way, as a new way to express myself. Well, you're, you're actually talking about empowerment yep. um, in the face of a really traumatizing fear that yep. is an unfortunate reality. And by kind of having a sort of fantasy self that you can kind of make sense of this and feel power when, uh, yep. when facing that, that, that's really, really interesting. Um, yep. So uh, any, any questions or Rachel, do you have some questions? I guess I'm curious what you would say to a nervous parent, because you did talk about some serious concerns. Mm. You talked about some serious downsides that can take place. So what advice would you have to worried parents? 
Uh, gaming is also a great way to learn. Um, my adoptive dad and his son will go on World of Warcraft and they'll read together. He's about 10. He's a uh, mid-functioning autistic and he has a bit of trouble with reading, but he loves watching his, get his dad game. And so they'll get on a game together and they'll practice their reading together while doing it. Mm -hmm. And gaming has also helped me learn more about social situations because mm -hmm. in real life there's kind of that fear of if I do something wrong I can't go back and redo it but meanwhile in games you can do that you can go back and redo something you can see if there's a different outcome and that's one of the things that I think has made me more confident is I know that you know there might not be the outcome that I necessarily want but that's not a bad thing I can still get to where I'm going one bad thing on the road isn't going to cancel my entire trip right yeah so there's great ways to to learn um also a good way to utilize gaming is use it as a reward uh something my mom did or at least tried to do is do you know if you do 10 minutes of cleaning then you can uh -oh. play games for an hour so <laughs> yes can we i love how you talk? said your mom tried to do that because <laughs> i tried to do that too it was always so hard to like keep track of it and count you know my son was a master um negotiator when it came to that stuff. Yeah. Peter, what about you? Do you have any uh, any parting advice to parents? So um, first off, what just want to add something to Spirit, uh, what Spirit was saying. I would love uh, to see how you engage with like Dungeons and Dragons or another tabletop role-playing game because a lot of what you've said about having a safe space to kind of explore and do different things and know it's going to turn out okay i would love to get your insight on how translating that to like a more tabletop gaming setting i think that would be really i'm interesting. actually working on making my own role play uh oh. right now too i'm close to finishing it there's a couple uh things that i need to finish doing but i'm really close to being able to play that with my friends and so um, yeah that is super exciting and uh if you if you feel comfortable you should send it to me i'd, I'd love to take a look at it yep. cool. yeah. uh, my mom has her hand up can we let her speak oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, i had to, I wanted to say that um so much of spirits elementary years i felt like an outsider not knowing what was going on inside of her head and when she started getting into special interests, um, I realized I had a way in. And it's not necessarily something that you want to do because I'm not interested in K-pop. I'm not interested in video games. I'm not gonna sit down and play the games with her. But when I go back to her room and say, how are you doing? And she says, I don't know. And I say, you feeling okay? And she says, I don't know. And that's not getting much information. But if I sit down on her bed and say, tell me about your new game, I get a flood of information. And if I wanted, I realized if I wanted to spend any time with my child and learn anything about her life, I needed to sit down and watch a K-pop concert. Or I needed to see how you build a character in Attack of the Titans 2, <clears throat> or I needed to have one built for me. Um, it's just you, by them talking about these games or talking about these special issues uh, or special interests, that's how you find out more about your child. So instead of fighting, I don't want you to do this anymore, I don't want you to do, I want you to do something else. If you sit down and take five, 10, 15 minutes of your own time and listen to them be excited, it makes them feel like you're interested, that you 
want to know more about what they're doing, that you somehow approve of what they're, they're doing. So I started doing that when Spirit was in middle school. And um, it's been great. I mean, I'm still tired of K-pop, but I'll still <laughs> listen to it in the car just to be next to Spirit and, and listening to what she knows about the bands and what's going on and, and whatnot. So anyway, that part has been really neat for me. Yeah. Like I remember there was one time where I first watched uh, Marvel's Avengers and I showed that to you and you were just like, oh, that's interesting, but I actually have something I want to show you. And we watched the um, Phantom of the Opera live at the, what was it? It was probably London. Yeah, it was a specific opera house. Okay. Uh, yeah, but we watched that and I really liked that and ended up getting into that as mm -hmm. well. So yeah, engaging with your kids in a topic of their interest, but then moving on to another topic can be a way to get there. Mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're really hitting on, I think, the, the core of special interests. A lot of the time, autistics and myself included, can't tell you how they're feeling. They really cannot, it, it, it's, yeah. it's they, they don't know. I they, they have to go through like an inventory in their head. Okay, am I feeling this? Am I feeling this? Is my body doing this? You know, what what are these these indicators? It, it took my mom to figure out. I think you cut out. Wait, Spirit, will you say that sentence again? You cut out. Yeah, you're cutting out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, no, I forget what I said. <laughs> oh. That's okay. Um, uh, but no, I, I think the, the nice thing about engaging with special interests is like, hey, you know, we don't know if we're happy or sad, but our brain is currently full of information oh yeah, no, that about was, this. That that's is what, what I was saying. I, I was saying that my, it took my mom a while to learn that I honestly don't know how I'm yeah. feeling a lot of the time. I don't know how I'm feeling, but I can tell you this cool fact about bees. That is, <laughs> that is my mood. Cool fact about this. You know, yeah. that, that is where I'm at. That is what is important to me. And that is what I want you to know about my well-being right now is that there is this cool fact about bees or, you know, something bad is happening with the bees and that's making me distraught because bees is all that matters right now. I don't matter. Bees matters. And if you understand that bees matters, you understand that I matter. Um, yep. so, I think a part of I think a part of the um, going with your child special interests into a uh, top of that you want is to, for me, being engaged in a new topic that I don't know much about was really scary. But if I start talking about something that I like and then move on to that topic really quick and then go back to what I like, I felt a lot more comfortable. So yes. New things are scary, but if you put new things with familiar things, it can be a lot less scary. I think kind of an overarching thing that has been kind of uh, brought up here is kind of a piece around trust and building trust and building communication. And you know, Rachel, you asked like, if you're nervous, how do you get around these things? Like, yes, there are some legitimate concerns around gaming and the internet and stuff having that level of trust and communication and sort of transparency and working to build that, that can be really helpful. Um, you know, if you know that, hey, this is a person that asks me about my special interests and cares about my special interests, I know they care about me and I feel a bit more comfortable approaching them because I know that they're not gonna tell me to shut up when I talk about trains or whatever. They're gonna say, okay, so, Blah, blah 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 trains blah, blah blah trains and also you know this scary thing happened to me today okay <laughs> um you know there's there's that level of just kind of um like i would say like autistic centered communication yeah. because sometimes it could be like here's this cool fact about bees here's this other cool fact about bees and also i just found out that my my childhood uh you know friend is got a car accident there's a hand jenny um i wanted to say that um 
even though Spirit is 21, going on 22, I still have access to her email just to help monitor things. She was caught in a scam ring. Um, and then her boyfriend kind of being part of that friend group, if there is an interaction that Spirit goes through with one of the friends that she does not understand or is really confused by, he will take the time outside of the, the setting on the Xbox to explain to Spirit, okay, this is what he was really saying. This is why what you said didn't make sense to him. This is, and kind of help her understand what the interaction was about to her autistic brain. He's really good at doing that. So Spirit has some kind of support netting underneath her through the whole exper online experience too. Yeah. No, that's, I, I think that's huge. You know, using gaming communities as a way to build that social safety net because, you know, building as many, you know, safety nets and supports, it's, it's so critical. Um, and, you know, no, no, nobody, you know, no person is an island. Um, and, you know, the more we can, you know, all raise each other up in any way and in any format and in any medium, it's all, it's all good. Yeah. One of the things I, I forgot to say during the interview, one of the things I love about my friends is that we're able to tease each other on our insecurities, but in a way that lifts each other up. Like um, my sibling Micah has um, Tourette's, they have tics, mm -hmm. but ever since uh, meeting my friend group and talking with them, they don't try to suppress them as much, which can be physically exhausting to them most of the time, but also physically can hurt them in some situations. And so, you know, with our friends finding their tics funny, but in a good way, they're not as, I guess, embarrassed about their tics in public it's not that big of a deal um like one of my friends Ethan is he's not the smartest he's not the smartest at all we still love him though we um come we we tease him about that a lot but he's just like yes I know I'm stupid oh, oh. <laughs> and he he mishears things a lot like um one time uh, Asher was talking to Doc in a video game and asked, hey, Doc, do you need a warm coat? And Ethan just pops in, why do you want to wear a horse? <laughs> and, uh, we're just like, Ethan, no, that's not what we said. But he likes to make fun of his not hearing things correctly with us. So it's a nice that we're able to make fun of each other, but in a way that empowers each other too so that's one of the things I love about my friends is I'm not as insecure when I'm with them they don't that's what friends see. should be yep they wherever you see. know them wherever yep, you meet them wherever see, you yeah they don't see me having autism as a bad thing it's oh you have a mental disability well all of us have at least one mental, dis <laughs> mental disability right, right. Yeah, yeah no uh, people who say that autistic people don't get sarcasm. A lot of sarcasm we struggle with, but within autistic, autistic friendships that are really developed, we are some of the most sarcastic people out there and we are constantly ragging on each other and just absolutely like just saying, sup idiots, how are you losers doing? Is you know, our way of saying, hi guys, I love you so much. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that friendly trash talking, it's something that we we really enjoy but in any case yeah. um, i want to stop us there because yeah, we're yeah. actually out of time yeah yeah yeah. I believe yeah. it that went so quick um, yeah. peter that was an incredible presentation spirit i am so grateful for your willingness to be here and to share yeah, and to open up for inviting me if you ever have any events like this in the future i would love to participate I, i'm so happy to hear that you're a really wonderful speaker thank you for being here thank you and thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you next time. Good night. Bye everyone.